dad's favorite songs he and I sang that a lot together so thank you for choosing that little Nora hymn number 590 trust and obey Yeah. 
song this morning is hymn number 287, Softly and Tenderly, 287. Please stand.
good morning. And thank you for our musicians for the beautiful music today. And music is always beautiful. And even if you can't sing like I can't, you can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So we just do the best we can. Today's scripture is uh, John 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Isn't that the truth, that Jesus, there is so much every word in the Bible refers back to Jesus, and he is our Savior and our Counselor, and he gave his life for us. And I am so thankful. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the time we have today to be with you. We thank you for the time that we have at home when we can read your word and learn more about you. You are the most important thing in our lives because you gave up your life that we might live and the day will come when you will call us home and we will be there with you and prayerfully and hopefully each one as we enter through the gate the lord will say well done my good and faithful servant Bless our church this day to a unity and a love for each other that is sometimes hard to do, but yet easy to do because Jesus shows us the model that we should go by. And we thank you for the fact that you are here with us to give us strength and courage and more and more knowledge of you. And I th we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Now we have a mission story today. It says, Gangster to God. And this uh, young man's name was Jason Rogers. He cried out to God, who he didn't know when he was 12 years old. I don't know how or why I was lonely at night in the dark, crying into my pillow. And 12, he was 12 years old at that time, the youngest of the children, and he lived with an aunt and, and um, uncle in New Zealand. And his parents deemed him uncontrollable, and he had been kicked out of school. And only, uh, uh, although he was only a boy, he was breaking into houses and stealing cars. At the age of 10, he had bought his first car with his first wages. earned by helping his father at a construction site. The vehicle was a rust bucket, he said, but he only wanted it for the license plates. Over the next 10 years, he placed those license plates on nine different cars that he had stolen. Jason didn't sense an immediate answer to his nighttime prayer and about a year later, his parents took him back home to New Zealand, a bigger city, and um, Auckland, New Zealand. Jason sank deeper into crime. When he was 15, he stole his first marijuana plant and moved in with his girlfriend 
and her, in her parents' home. He joined a street gang and sold marijuana for several years. Then he became addicted to meth and sold the drug to support his habit of 11 years. How he, uh, I was heavily involved with gangs and the underworld, he said. I was known for home invasions, kidnapping, and extortion. I had three cooks and four distributors working for me in a syndicate. And it doesn't sound to me like they were cooking food. It sounded like they were cooking something else. He's also carried wads of cash every two or three days he earned 10,000 New Zealand dollars, which was actually 7,000 US dollars from the sale of meth. Then one day, he, he, um, a man named in Andrew approached him at the public swimming pool and invited him to free kickboxing classes. Jason jumped at the opportunity, thinking that it would help him to pump up, build up his body. So they did their little kickboxing routine, and then Andrew bought out a, a pile of Bibles and announced, let's gather around the table and share. And Jason wasn't too awfully enthused about it, but for some reason, he decided to stay, so he did. As Andrew spoke for 30 minutes, Jason raged against God in his mind. He thought, who is God? I am God in my own world. I have worked my own, I have workers, my own minions. I am well respected and highly looked upon. I am God. He returned to reality when Andrew ended the meeting by reading Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust and destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jason was confused about how could he lay up his treasures in heaven out of the reach of rust and fellow thieves. He pondered the matter all week and returned to the class the next Wednesday. After several weeks, Andrew asked him if he would like to help lead the class. Jason was surprised and pleased. To qualify as an instructor, he took a first aid course at Andrew's Church, Papatoto Seventh-day Adventist Community Church. Soon Jason was attending Sabbath worship services with Crystal, his girlfriend, and their seven children. He accepted Jesus, and after 21 years living with Crystal, he asked for her hand in marriage. The church celebrated its largest family baptism when uh, the two youngest children were dedicated to Jesus on that day. Jason said his life has changed completely over the past three years. We no longer live with, the, with six foot fences, baseball bats, sawed off shotguns, and Rambo style knives. We now live with white picket fences and I own my own handyman business. He still co-leads the kickboxing class, which has yielded at least six baptisms. A slid, tear slid down his cheek as he thought about his, his parents. I used to receive calls from my worried mother every day, he said, and in an interview in an Auckland diner, she witnessed firsthand the ugly nature of what I had become. Now I don't 
hear from her, and I take that as a good sign. He hopes to point his parents and others to Christ. Now I am peaceful, happy. He said, I wouldn't change it for anything. I am God's disciple now, and I want to share the world as much as I can in any way he wants me to. So that's a wonderful change for that young man. And God does perform miracles. Now I have a, <clears throat> a miracle story of my own. I know you've, I've been up here and I've told miracle stories before. I have a brother who lives in Idaho and he has um, Agent Orange myeloma, it's called Agent Orange disease. And for, since 2011, when he first almost died over Christmas, it's been a kind of an up and down and up and down way of life for him because it comes and it goes and he's on chemotherapy and he's off of chemotherapy. Well, he lived up in the hills in Idaho and he twice during the winter a couple of years ago, he um, had to be taken to, by ambulance to the hospital, but an ambulance couldn't get up the hill where they live. They had to take him down in a four-wheel drive and put him in the ambulance. So um, he decided that they needed to move out of the hills and down into the lower, you know, where he was closer to the hospital and medical care. Now he had a beautiful dog beautiful um, yellow lab. She had yellow eyes and a pink nose. And she was a big dog and a heavy dog. And uh, he, she had a mind of her own. And she'd just take off, you know, even if he was pulling her, she'd just take off and go. And, and he had had her train, but the training didn't work very well. So after they had moved to, down to the flatland, um, one day he was taking her out, going to take her out in the backyard, and she pulled on him so hard that she pulled him down and injured him pretty bad. So he decided that he had to get rid of her which almost broke his heart. I mean, he loved that dog. It was a, his birthday present, and he loved that dog, but he just couldn't handle her. He was too weak to handle a dog that big. So his daughter, Natalie, fished around among the people that she knew and found a place for that dog that had 20 acres to run on and a boy to play with. So it was a perfect situation for Harley, but it wasn't a perfect situation for him. It, it just was so hard on him, and he would get up in the morning, and he would get dressed, and he would sit in his chair, and he would go back to sleep and sleep for hours and get up and eat and go back to sleep. And he was extremely, extremely depressed. Well, one day, this lady that knew another lady that knew Nat, Natalie, his daughter, she was driving down the road, and there was this little dog sitting beside the road, and it was a dachshund, a little brown dachshund. So she stopped and picked it up, and uh, she couldn't keep it, so she talked to this other lady she knew, and she said, yes, I can, I, uh, Natalie can find it, find it a home. So Natalie is champion of the stray dogs. So she took it to Natalie and Natalie had it for two or three months. And she said, you know, dad, she says, you need a dog. 
and he's, he didn't want any dog. He, he was still so depressed over Harley. He didn't want another dog. So she kept kind of nagging at him. And so one day they went over there and when that dog saw him, she just kind of nailed her nose right on his leg. And that's where she stayed. Every step he took, she was right against him. So finally it was time for him to go home. They headed out for the truck. Well, the dog beat him to the truck and she, the minute he opened the door, she hopped in, landed herself right between the two front seats and that's where she stayed. So she has been with him ever since. And who knows where she come from. I still say she's an angel dog. I believe that God sent her for him because he needed her so bad. And um, so she, she is with him every minute of every day, everywhere he goes. That dog knows where he's headed. When he gets up in the morning and starts dressing, she zips in the living room and grabs his chair. And uh, any time he's doing anything, that dog is with him. It's just the dog was, the dog was made for him. And I just call her a miracle dog and an angel dog because she has been exactly what he needed to bring him out of his depression and get him back on his feet. Now he's going back into some chemotherapy and I truly feel that this dog will help him get through the chemotherapy that he has to take once again. And uh, I just look forward to, to seeing her and see those two together. And so I'm very, very happy for him that as, as far as I'm concerned, God sent him the dog. And uh, so she is a, a little beauty. And now it's time for our classes. We have a class over here and we have a class in the sanctuary and I believe there's still one in the library. You can choose whichever class you want and a happy Sabbath to, us, to each one. And may you enjoy the day.
Good morning. Good to see you. Morning, sir. Visiting up here again? Are you visiting up here again? No. No? Visiting. Yeah, visiting. Okay. All right. Let's um, turn in our lesson to <clears throat> lesson 10. Lesson 10. Let's bow our heads and let's have prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings, your protection, the many things that you've done for us this past week. And we ask that you'd please send your Holy Spirit as we worship you this Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, did anybody have anything happen this week that was of significance? Yes, Doug.
Yeah, I, I feel sorry for people like who experience that. I mean, we, we live here in Oregon, and I, I am continually Im impressed with how beautiful we live in the place. I mean, not much happens around here when it comes to weather. You know, we, we complain about the rain now and then and a few things like that, but really? I mean, compared to New York or wherever? You had forest fires. Up, up. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, but. Yeah. Oh, Maine, okay, right. But, you know. Um, we're. Uh, USBs? That's all I have, yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, you know, I, I see these events happen and I think to myself, wow, you know, how does this all fit into end time events? What is going on? Yes, thought there? Yes. And Ellen White is playing about climate change. Mm hmm. Playing. Yeah. Science of Source Man and Ellen White said when we see the change in the weather significantly, we know the end is near. Do you think the change the weather's changing? I don't think so, because when you study the history, yeah. you know, it's always yeah. changing. But you know, Ellen White also talks about cities being destroyed. Now, I suppose you might say 50,000 people on an island out in the Bahamas, well, that's not really a city. I mean, that's not that big. But you think about, I mean, everybody in the world knows where the Bahamas are. I mean, I don't know quite how this all fits, but it, you know, it gives me pause in terms of the times we live in and the things that are taking place. Okay, well, let's look at our lesson today. We're on lesson 10, and it's entitled Living the gospel living the gospel so let me ask you a question what does the word gospel mean to you what does the word gospel mean to you jenka yes please good news freedom from sin okay Anybody want to add to that? Expand on that? <coughs> Redirect that? I'll give you a point. Yes, okay. True education. True education, the gospel, okay, okay. Um, true education, can you kind of pa unpack that a little bit, what you mean there? I grew up close to Elm Haven, so with Arthur White, you know, James and Elm yeah. White's grandson. Uh -huh. Really? And yes. Yeah, so that's okay. part of my history. Okay. So the gospel is that we are to take to the world is the message that you know that, that, that people need to know. The gospel that the people need to know, okay. Yeah. About uh, Jesus, Jesus, okay? To me the gospel is looking ahead. Yes. Look for what's ahead. Too many people today live in the past. Right. They want to go back and, oh, how was it? How was that? And everything's always in the past. And they live the past. Okay. So look ahead to something that's better. You can change what's ahead, but you can't change what's the past. You can't change what's happened in the past, only in terms of what's in the future. Okay. Um, Not being taken by an overwhelming surprise. Okay. About what Jesus has done for us, about his his death and resurrection, and, and his what he has done for us. What's another word, What's another phrase that we use for the gospel? Good news. Okay. The plan of salvation. Okay. 
we're in a predicament. We're in, um, we're in danger. Well, actually, we're dying is what we're doing. <clears throat> um, and the gospel is a message that gives us hope. The people in the Bahamas right now need to hear the gospel, okay? Not the gospel in the, in the capital G sense, but they need, they need a message that, that help is coming, that there is hope, that this is not just all over. As we see what's happening, they need to be taught how to build their house on the rock and not on the sand. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Yeah, literally and figuratively. The only problem is sometimes those places there are no what? There are no rocks. Okay, to live on, to build on. Okay, let's open our Bibles to um, John 3.16. And this is probably a verse that most of us don't need to actually open to. But it reads as follows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What words jump out to you in this text? So loved, okay. So loved, yes, Jacob. Eternal. Eternal life, okay. Gave. What's that? Believes. Believes, okay. Um, the, ones, the words that jump out to me is not perish. Yeah. Not perish. Perish. In the dictionary, it does away with a burnt, ever burning hell. Okay. Sure. Anybody, anybody that believes in an ever-burning hell is this. This. This text makes no sense. No sense. Okay. But you know, the focus for me is the fact that in this earth we're going to perish unless somebody takes action. Yes, Ron. Out to me uh, recently when I read it was God. God. God the Father who loves the world and doesn't want it to perish. He is the one who gave his son. Jesus didn't come on his own. He gave Jesus to us. The devil has us wanting to look at God the Father as being mean, ugly, severe, God, severe yeah. demanding, and yet this text is completely different. It talks about the Father. Not so much about Christ. Yeah. And yet we apply it to Christ, of course. We what? We apply it to Christ rather than Father. So many religions. This is where they. Ah, I see what you're saying. Yes, okay. So this is. Aha, uh -huh, yes, okay. So m many people view God. Partic so, so, yeah, okay, I see where you're going. Um, the God of the Old Testament is what? God of the New Testament. Stern, severe, severe, judgmental. Right. But the New Testament, we have who? Jesus. That, that's the way many people would like, you know, tend to look at, at the Bible. But in reality, the, same, the God who, who sent Jesus loved just as much as Jesus loved us. Yes, Ron? In the Old Testament, we do have Jesus in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because God sent his son to Abraham. Yeah. He was one of the angels. He got disguised as an angel and tried to save Saul and the Lord, but they didn't accept it. So Jesus was the one who caused the flood to kill all the people, including the animals. No, no it was their own doing. Yeah. So we're going to talk about some of this in the sermon today. <laughs> so we'll get into some of these details. Yes, uh, uh, Curtis. I would like to go back to verse John three sixteen to one word there that is one of the longer words. Okay. It's actually three words in one. Whosoever. Whosoever. 
so uh, and one little boy defined that this way you and me and anyone else. Now, within the context of our lesson this quarter, why do you think this is being brought up at this point in time? <clears throat> It is the good news, okay? And let's see, how do I ask this question? <clears throat> is, um, the, the, the situation that existed in Christ's time, um, when Jesus made this statement, to whom did it apply in the minds of the disciples? Jews. Themselves. Okay. Gentiles. Well, so that's where I'm kind of wrestling with here because I think that in many ways, from from you know, as Jesus is talking to the disciples, the, the disciples are Jews, and the disciples, like most Jews, their view of God was is that they were the chosen people, and they were the ones for whom salvation was available. The immediate context, however, for this passage is he's talking with Nicodemus, who came to him in the middle of the night for a midnight interview. So uh -huh. This wasn't generally spoken to the disciples. I mean, how do we know about it? Probably Nicodemus shared it. Sure, with John. okay. Um, so Jesus was primarily talking to a Jew who thought he already had everything together, telling him that I'm including you, that whosoever believes in me will not be condemned to have eternal life. And he was speaking to Nicodemus as one who needed yes. that to happen. He assumed it was already in place, but in fact, he, Nicodemus, assumed, but in reality, Jesus was saying, you know what, you need it just as much as everybody else does. Um, <clears throat> what I see here is that <clears throat> the, the author is wanting us to recognize that, in fact, the gospel is for everyone. It is an invitation that extends to everyone. And the fact that you and I know about the gospel does not mean that it applies to us exclusively, but rather that it places on us an obligation to share that gospel with other people. Now, <clears throat> um, Let's look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians verse 2. And let's start with verse 8. And this is a verse that most of us are familiar with. We've heard before. Verse, chapter 2, verse 8 of Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why is the author bringing this verse into the lesson this week and this quarter? Well, it could be that there's been a, a focus on the practical application of the gospel, that we all need to be doing something. Okay. And, and perhaps 
Um, he's bringing this up now so that we do not begin to rely on those good works that God has indeed planned for us to do. He purposes us to do them as a means of salvation. That that's already been accomplished. As a means of salvation. So that, I think, is the, 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 um, the ditch that it's easy for us to, to slide off into. The more we do, by the way, let me ask you a question. Is doing things wrong or bad? No. That's how we get things done, <laughs> okay, is by doing things, okay? So there's nothing wrong with doing things. What's that? Well, I assume in this group, everybody's doing good things. Is that a face of the safe assumption? <laughs> Everybody is doing good things, okay? Yes? Bob and I have had this discussion this week numerous times. Yeah. Time. Is, you know, do we do good things in order to get points? Or are we doing good things because of that we, we have this gift? Sure. And it's, it is a, it's a, it's a really fine line. Of, are, am I helping this person so that will give me a, a little bit extra credit? And, and you know, the, that's kind of a hard thing when we're living for Christ. And mm -hmm. It's a good point, but I think as long as we always remember our great need, is, as long as we keep that in perspective, our great need in light of salvation, that we've been saved by Christ, and that's the only basis on which we can have any confidence, then whatever we do then will spring forth from an appreciation of what he's done for us and what he's doing for us. So let me ask you a question. Um, this is going to be tricky. How do I say this? Um, how do you know when you're doing something for the right reason or for the wrong reason. The Bible says the poor we will always have with us. Okay, the poor will always be with us. And Ellen White talks specifically about the worthy poor. The worthy poor, okay. And I live on an Indian nation in Arizona now. Yeah. And I have been around several Indian nations. South Dakota for 20 years, okay. etc. I see what welfare has done, mm -hmm. worse than alcohol, mm -hmm. to the Native Americans. Okay. So we're dealing with that right now. And so we have guidelines in, in uh, two of the compilations that are written on Ellen White's writing on the people that we should be helping. Okay, okay, that's, that's one side of the equation, but, but, but I, I'm walking down the street, I'm doing something, minding my own business, and I am confronted with a situation in which I can help somebody. How do I know if I'm doing it for the right reason or not? Doug. So if, if, if you recognize a need and you're willing to step forward to, to fill that need, then that's what Christ did. Okay. Selflessness. Okay. So everybody that does not have this message is needy, whether they're poor or rich. Okay. Spiritually they're needy. The gospel. Right, okay. Does not have the gospel is needy. Yeah, but, but I'm looking at this verse here, verse 11, or uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. Gift, grace, works, boast. These are words that are in this phrase here. You know, one's good, one's bad. I, I think we're probably always going to struggle a little bit with the tension of whether our motivation's right. Because in the same instant, I feel compelled to help someone I'm also tempted with. The idea that if I do that, well, I'm somehow good? 
for doing that. And I think that when those times happen, we should ask God to help us do the thing that he's called us to do. And then and to help us have the right motivation, help us sort it out. But I don't think having the wrong motivation or worried about having the wrong motivation should keep us from doing that way either. We should just do it. Okay. So what did you, oh, I'm sorry, Ron? Was there times when Christ saw people in need, but he couldn't help them? There were, okay, there were times when people saw people in need, but he couldn't help them. Okay. Let me ask you this question. Is it good to pray? Yeah. Do you pray enough? No. Okay. What did Jesus, where did Jesus tell people to pray? In their closet. Okay. Why did Jesus tell them to pray in their closets? So it's not for show. Okay, because there was a tendency among certain people in his time who would make a big show of praying very beautiful, thought-out prayers. I know I, my prayers are somewhat simple, um, but they could really they could really pray. And, what did you, and, and so praying is good, and now Jesus comes along and says what? Pray in your closet. But they were, they were boasty. They, they wanted everybody to see. They were flaunting it. They were proud, and it wasn't a, a prayer of okay. their heart. So let's now apply the principle to works, helping others, Salvation. What? How do we make this make sense, Richard? Fasting. When you're fasting, you're not supposed to show your countenance or whatever it is. You're not supposed to show people that you're suffering. <laughs> or you know, you're supposed to keep it private. Okay. So I think one of the things that I think there's a couple things that come into play when it comes to helping people who have who we think are needy. And by the way, that's, that's a challenge sometimes. How do you decide if somebody's needy or not? It's a hard thing sometimes. Especially when you're going down and there's all these down in Portland, all yep. these right. You know, uh, first of all, one thing that for me is this, and that is, is the little saying that goes like this, but for the grace of God, there go I. I see people, and I think to myself, whoa, you know, why is it that I'm here and they're there? What, what happened that that happened? But do they have less grace than God because they're in that situation? Oh, no, I think God loves them every bit as much. Right. But the question is, so, <clears throat> okay. And, and, and it seems to me that it, it's not so much a true statement. There, but for the grace of God, go I. It, it's to me. It's a straight statement of there go I. Okay. This is me. Okay. So now, now let's. So I've I've identified somebody who needs who has a need, and I'm going to I've decided I'm going to do something for them. But the challenge is, you know, am I doing it because I'm trying to earn points with God, or? Is it, is it for the right purpose? So I don't think that's for anybody to judge. That's my, my, between me and God and what my attitude is. I'm not judging anybody. No. I, I'm looking at my own, I'm looking at this verse and saying, so how does this apply to me? You know, how do I know or what helps me to have the, the right reason for why I'm doing it? Yes, Richard. A lot of times when I, if I see somebody on the side of the road broken down, I've been there. Yeah, okay. Or somebody needs a ride, or somebody needs something. I've been there personally. I know what it's like to be stranded on yeah. the road and not having anybody stop for help. Yeah, that's, that's a very, um, that type of experience tends to change one's perspective on a lot of things. Hmm, I've been there before. I know what it's like to be there and not have somebody stop it. But there's, there's an element in the world today where we have all been burned okay. by people that we thought were in need. Yep. 
And, and uh, we, we had a lady friend, this is one of our favorite laughs. She, she saw someone in need, she gave what she had for them, and the next day, she seen that they weren't really destitute. They were out panhandling. She went up and knocked on their door and said, I want my money back. <laughs> and they just laughed at her, but I mean. Yeah, there's always going to be that situation. So, yeah. Um, I don't like the quote, quote from it. I think she had a saying that I give people a hand up. I don't give them a hand out. Okay, hand up. And I think Christ kind of followed that and when he went to minister to people, before he healed them, he said, your sins are forgiven. I want you to get on a new road, a new path. Now, do you accept that? Yes, I can heal you. Go do this. What was one of the, oh yes, uh, I think the key to this whole thing is love. Amen. You okay. do things because of love, it becomes automatic. Jesus had whole system is love. And we don't have enough of it. Amen. So I think one of the things that comes into play here in terms of trying to keep this perspective straight, earning points versus love, okay, is applying the same principle that Jesus gave us in relationship to praying in our closets and fasting in a way that nobody knows that you're fasting. In other words, I think that we should be as eagle-eyed as possible to identify people who have real needs. And I think we should be <clears throat> proactive in trying to meet those needs in whatever way we can. But because of this problem that I have, which is called pride, it's best if nobody knows about it. I think it's best if nobody knows about it. That way then, it's only between me and God. And God will have a way of getting through to me and helping me understand the fact that everything that I think I have that's mine is really what? His. And I'm just supposed to use it in whatever way I can to meet needs of people. Um, that to me is the, is, is, the, is the principle that I think helps me the most keep this in perspective. Because it is very easy to get carried away with the fact that, you know, well, I, I helped this many people this week. And Lord, aren't I, my goodness, aren't I, am, I am such a generous person. Yeah, exactly. Yes, uh, Ethan. There's kind of two sides to this okay. conversation. One is we can do works to try and gain favor with people yes. and say, look, look at me, I'm doing this. But then I think we can still be doing things in secret mm -hmm. to get points with God rather than other people. Of course, of course. Um, yes, but, but I think that it's, how do I say this? I think it's actually harder to do that. We tend to become proud the more people know what we're doing. That's what is the downfall. Particularly if somebody's parading me up on the platform and saying, do you know what this brother did? I mean, this is just wonderful. Can we all give him a hand? No. Ken? We're told at our left hand is not supposed to know what our right hand is doing. Okay, what does that mean? That means that even yourself or your close people you know don't even need to know what you're doing. Okay. Jesus, we're told that he went in and healed whole villages. Yes. And I'm sure that not every one of those people followed him after that. And so sometimes we have to help situations 
may, we don't know what the outcome is going to be or anything, yeah, but we just help them because of love. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with that statement. The, um, and, and one of the things that I've always wondered about in that, in that, with the context within that statement is the question here. Did the people in those villages actually know that they had been healed because of Jesus? Huh? Not of that man, but of Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, here's a village, you know, various people are sick. I mean, who knows, you know, and Jesus goes through town and people are healed. Did they actually make the connection all the time? You think so? Maybe. I don't know. Oh, it was no small thing for him to come through. You know, they talk about the throngs of people that, that plagued him, you know. So Yeah, but there were times when it was just Jesus and his disciples walking across the country and you know, they stopped and got a drink at Jacob's well and went into town to get some food and you know, they could have gone on down the road and nobody would ever know anything had happened. But is it possible that people could have been healed in that village and not even known that it was Jesus who was there? I don't know. Okay, let's look at um, Wednesday. Oh, yes, Richard. Right now, uh, I heard on the radio the other day that Adna is looking for donations. Yes. To help the people who in the Bahamas and struck by it. All that. They won't know where that money came from other than it came from the Seventh day of the church. So, yeah. Very true. Yeah. Yes, Jenka. Healed, the Bible said that they gave glory to God for it. Okay, yes, okay, very good. Before we move on, uh, we can't make a snap judgment in helping people. Acts is plain on judgment. Um, Acts 16 15, Lydia, seller of purple. If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible talks about judgment. Yes. This woman is saying to the apostles, mm -hmm. judge me. Okay. We must gain their confidence. They're judging us. So we must judge them too. And, and not just throw them into the So what does it mean to judge? What does it mean to judge? Oh, oh, that's huge. You know, but you can you can get, you can get a pretty good idea of why people are in the condition that they're in. I'm gonna say that when it says here to judge, in this case, I think it means make a decision. Sure. Okay. And you know what? The reality is, is that you and I interact with people almost that fast sometimes. And sometimes we have to make a decision on the spot. Am I going to help this person? Am I not? What am I going to do? Etc. And sometimes we make a decision and bingo, we get taken. Okay? But on other situations, we may have actually met a need and not even realized the level of need that we met. Uh, but we made a decision and I think that's where the Holy Spirit comes into the picture. And it doesn't always involve money. Oh, of course not. Absolutely. It can, it can involve as little as what? Word. A smile. That's exactly right. A point of uh, encouragement. You go first. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes. On Tuesday, September 3rd. Yes. I think I'm on the right one. Yep. On the, in the middle, it says, again, we do not do good works, like care for the poor, yep. lift up the oppressed, feed the hungry, in order to earn salvation or standing with God. Exactly. And I think this is kind of what this discussion yeah. is. Are we doing it? Why are we doing that? It's not for me to make more points for exactly. God. It's to help that person who needs it. And it's not necessarily up to me to make that to, to judge. I agree. I agree. I, I don't think we should be judged. Um, but I do think that it's, it is reasonable for us to, to ask ourselves from time to time, what are my motives for why I'm yeah. doing this? 
why am I doing this? Is it, is it really because I care for this person or is it because of, well, I, I know I better do it because if I don't, why? Yes, uh, Jim. I think truth really needs to play high in this. What is true about this situation? What is true about the need? Is there a real need there? And then what is true in relation to me? And yes, I, I may be tempted right at this moment to think there's something good, good in me as a result of doing this. But what is the truth of that? Well, I know the truth is that, but for the grace of God, I would be in the same situation. And I have received grace from God. And so I can give grace to this person. That's the truth of the situation always. If we can tell ourselves the truth, we can recognize the other idea as a temptation of the devil and by God's grace resist that. I agree. Okay, if you have your Bibles, let's look on Wednesday. I'd like you to look at Malachi 2, verse 10. There's a number of verses here that I think it's good for us to go through. Verse 10 says, Have we not all what? One Father. Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another profaning the covenant of our fathers. What does it mean when it says, why then are we faithless to one another? Why do we deal treacherously? Why do we deal treacherously? Betray. Betray. Okay. So what does it mean to be, so let's rephrase that then. What, is, what would it mean to say when we said, if we, if we were to say it this, why are we faithful to one another? What does that mean? Converse. That's good news. That's the gospel. Okay. That's the result of the gospel because the evil started in heaven. They okay. Started here, came here. We we're all born with that propensity. We've got to get over that. Okay. And that's the gospel. Yes. I think it's the golden rule. Okay. Why, why do we treat people the way we would want to be treated versus why do we take vengeance? Okay. So being faithful means you recognize the need in whatever way you try to meet that need and you move on. Why? Because that individual is a what? No points. Because that person is what? No point. Because that person is what? My brother, my sister. Because we share the same what? Father, creator God. I see my brother, I don't say, whoa, bro, what are you doing? You know, you deserve that over there. Learn a lesson or two. No, I step up and I help my brother and my sister. Okay, let's look at Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 26. <clears throat> Paul, no, excuse me, Luke here pre uh, speaking. And he made from every man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries. What is Luke saying here? Uh, Acts 17, verse 26. Acts 17, verse 26. And he made from one man, every nation of mankind, to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allocated periods and the boundaries, and boundaries. What is, what is Luke saying here? Yes, James. Universal brotherhood, okay. And what's that? Brotherhood, exactly. Out of a fatherhood comes brotherhood. Exactly, okay. <clears throat> but what does this also mean here? It says, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. What does that say?
Nations rise, nations fall. Nations expand, nations fall apart. Nothing was left to chance. Because of what? God is in control. Let me ask you a question here. How many of you are concerned about the 2020 election? Yeah. Uh, isn't that isn't that interesting that's, to think about? That's what it's got to be. You know, I start thinking about things. Oh man, I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned about. I said, wait, 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 wait. Who's going to really determine who's what? This is the great controversy. This is the great controversy. That's exactly right. God is involved. God is engaged. God is not allowing things to just. I mean, it will fall apart, but he is in his time. In his time. Thank you very much. Yes, and, Doug. And I, I agree with what you're saying, but I find that there is today a fear that I've not felt before that if I don't pay attention, things will happen like behind our backs. You know? yeah. we, need to, we need to be vigilant yeah. at the gate. Well, I'm, I'm not saying yeah. well, stick your head in a hole and, and pretend it isn't happening. I think it's important that we be, be informed, but I think, you know, I can sleep at night. And Mrs. White says we should never do anything that brings on the end. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> but you know, there are many, many people today in society, they're afraid. They're, they're, they're scared about what's going to happen if someone wins or this person loses or whatever. No, you know what? God is in control and God will override or bring down whoever it is, yes. As the head of the Air Force said, 9-11. Yeah. We could have known. We could have known. If we weren't paying attention. We were busy watching the news. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, um, let's look at verse 28. Uh, excuse me, Romans 3, verse 23. Romans 3, 23. And this again is a reminder to us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. That includes me. And then Galatians 3.28. Galatians 3.28 reads as follows. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be one in Christ Jesus? Okay. That we would all be one. Okay. And as he and his father are one. one. Okay. I hadn't made that connection, but that's a good connection. I like that. And this next verse says heirs to the promise. Heirs to the promise. Okay. So I think the, the point that is being made here by Paul is the fact that it doesn't really make any difference where you are in the socioeconomic scale. It doesn't make any difference gender. It doesn't make any difference whether you're a slave or free or whatever else. The fact is that God's plan of salvation applies equally to you as it does to anybody else. Regardless of what, speaking of points, one may think they've done, the bottom line is we're all equal. You know the story that Jesus told of the sheep and the goats who came before the judge, and Jesus separates the two. And, um, I think the thing that, that strikes me the most about that story is the fact that, speaking to the sheep, they, they didn't know what he was talking about, you know, as far as why they were being saved. And Jesus had to actually remind them, you know, you did this and this and this and this. For that person over there, 
But in a, in a sense, that was actually being done for me. And it was like, oh, wow, I never thought about that. I didn't realize that. <coughs> that was the decision. They weren't even aware of the fact that they were taking care of the needs of other people, even as if they were Jesus. Okay. Revelation 14, verse 7. What is the significance of Revelation 14, verse 7? Revelation 14, verse 7 reads as follows. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, speaking of judgment earlier, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The gospel is to be taken to whom? The whole world. That's exactly right. And um, you and I are invited to live that gospel. That's the other word in the title here. Live. Which speaks louder? Words or actions? Actions. Words or actions. The memory text for today was Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So my prayer is, is that as you go about your activities, work, recreation, school, etc., that you recognize that you are here for a purpose, and that is to do the work of God, ministering to the needs of people, and in that process, make a statement on his behalf in relationship to the great controversy and the plan of salvation. Let's stand and let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your patience with us. Please forgive us for when we have gotten our priorities mixed up. May we learn to recognize your Holy Spirit's promptings. And as we have occasion, speak on your behalf and live on your behalf. Bless us now as we continue to worship you this Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you.